Welcome back to RDWorks Learning Lab. I thought we'd finished with path control with the last session, but then I decided I would do a little bit of work with paper. The papers are a material which ought to be very easy to cut. My biggest problem was how do you hold it? How do you support it? How do you stop it blowing away? So maybe it wasn't quite as easy as I thought. I started doing a little bit of research on the old interweb. I came across something that you must watch. Um, the guy's an absolute genius and I can never aspire to that because I'm not an artist, I'm an engineer. But what it did do was prompt me into thinking I'm sure I can do something with paper. So what I did, I started looking around the internet for various bits and pieces that I could piece together to make a paper project. Here we are in October, not very far away from Christmas. So I thought I'll try and be a bit different this year and I'll make all my own Christmas cards out of laser cut paper. I've copied bits of design from all over the place. Most of the stuff that you'll pull off is not suitable directly for cutting. If we look closely at this snowflake here, um, I made a mistake when I first started it, uh, although I simplified it. Um, across the top here you'll notice that there's no bar. It's not a closed object because if it was a closed object the centre would actually fall out. Maybe you want the centre to fall out. I like the idea that really what I'm doing is doing a drawing, a black drawing, on a piece of white paper. This particular object here has got pieces that fall out, but you'll notice that at the ends here they don't meet because I don't want the whole thing to fall out, I just want pieces of it to fall out. So what we've got basically is a, is a fold card where it folds down the edges here into the center. And then what I've done, I've made provision for a completely separate thin flimsy paper infill. Now I've imported both pieces together. I'm not going to cut both pieces together because there's another problem which we will encounter when we get to the machine. And so what I'm going to do first of all is to remove this one and just reposition now in the last session we talked about how to order cuts and we looked at this feature here which was the edit cut property let's take a look here at this edit cut property and let's take a look at how many elements there are in here element number one let's go right down to the bottom 519. You'll notice that this element here, which is the outside, which I like to cut last, obviously, because you don't want any of this lot to fall out first, um, you'll notice it's 503. I found out by trial and error on this job that I can't necessarily force it to the back of the queue. It all depends on how you've got another feature in here set. Let me just explain. So if we put a marquee around this, if we go up here to cut optimize, we get a little window up which gives us a few options in here. And we get all sorts of things like we can auto determine the start point and the direction. I will untick that. We can select inner to outer, single inner to outer, we've got inside to outside or order of layer so if we leave none of these on and we empty them all out and I say OK the quickest way to see what's going on and we do a simulation and I will just jump through this now right now we've got to this point here and all of a sudden it decides I'll cut the outside but I haven't finished all the inside yet and it goes back to do this part and of course it's fallen out so it can't do this part so let's take a look again at editing the cut property <clears throat> we really want the last item to be cut it's the outside we decided that that was hiding near the bottom of the list Not now it's not. 
See, now that we've turned that feature off, this path is no longer at the bottom of the list. So here we are, that path has now changed to 373. So one of the things that we could possibly do is to use standard Windows technology, which is to mark that one, hold down the Shift key, and go right to the top of the list, and then we can send that lot, which is number one, through to 373, across to the new list. Then we could go to 374, and go to the bottom of the list, hold the Shift key, and send that across as well. OK, so the only item that we've got left in there now is the outside shape. So we can send that across, and that's the last one in the list. There it is, item 373. Let's do OK, and let's go back and take a look at our simulation again. So it's starting off exactly the same as it did before. We'll jump through again. And it hasn't made any difference at all. It's still going off cutting at the same point. So how do we get that to the last item? It's definitely the last item in the list. Let's go back to our settings again up here. Let's put the marquee around it. Cut Optimize. Order of layer. If we tick that one, what happens? Let's have a look, see what the cut has done. back at 373. Let's go back to here again. Cut optimize. Let's do inside to outside. Where's our right side now? Would you believe it? It's right at the bottom of the list. So if you've got a complex item like this. I mean there's no way that I'm going to sit down and carefully order 518 items when I can let the machine do it for me and the only thing I've got to do is make sure that item 519 is the last one cut. Now I'm not going to cover all the combinations but I just want to point out to you that this particular little box has a tremendous effect on the way in which you can control the cut. It isn't just that list. Well, that's the key feature of this particular session. The fact that you need to play with both of these commands to get your cuts ordered. Right, well, here we are looking down into my machine and you can see I've still got my original pin table that I designed from the nails that came out of the packing case for this. Now, after a, a little bit of um, work on the top here, you can see that what's actually happened is the, uh, the acrylic seems to have shrunk a bit and the ends have now lifted up. And that's not good because I can't keep a nice even um, focal point as I move across the table. Probably consign this one to the bin. And we're going to work with a Mark II. Now the Mark II version is basically a steel plate which is already nice and flat. That's about 16 gauge that plate. And what I've then done is manufactured some 10 millimeter thick acrylic plates which have got holes drilled through them at roughly one inch square. They're on a one inch pitch either way. And it does mean that I can now place these in here in different positions. I'm going to be using something that I've had for quite a few years, uh, gold coated pins that are used for pr testing printed circuit boards. But basically what they are is a fixed length pin. Now you could use something like a, a two millimeter dowel or a three millimeter dowel that is something like um, maybe 25 or 30 millimeters long and it would do exactly the same job. The important thing is that they're all 
the same length within a very small amount. So nails will not really do the job. But all I've got to do now is wherever I want a support, I can just drop these into a hole. Now they pass right through the hole and they reference on the steel plate at the back. Um, several people have said that the best way of cutting this is on uh, a slatted table where the slats run across that way. But whenever you go across a slat, you'll still get some sort of reflection on the back and maybe a burn mark. Um, so really the ideal thing to do is to cut everything in air and not pass across any of these contact points at all. What I'm going to try and do is to support the paper around the outside and also support the paper in the centre where I know I haven't got any cuts. OK, so we've got the, uh, we've got the focus set just about right. Watch carefully because everything happens so fast. Now this is a, about a 220 or 230 gram card and I was running that at only 15-18% power. I don't have any significant sign of burning on the surface and there's even less on the back. I don't actually need a modelling knife to do this or a Stanley knife but I'm doing it just so that it's easy for you guys to see what I'm doing. I'm just bending the tags up very slightly. I didn't want to bend the flames, I just wanted to bend the, the canvas. So now we've got five tags on there, and look, we've got five slots in here. So with a bit of luck, I'm hoping that I should be able to thread the candles through the top slots, like this, and like this, and then once I've threaded the candles on, hopefully I should be able to push this on and they will slip on as well. Now to do the bends on the end here, you can see the cut line down there. What I'm going to do is put my ruler so that it lines up with that cut line. Then I'm going to lift this edge up and put my fingernail just at the ends here where the material is. Okay, So the bend will occur where I want it and not where nature wants it to go. So now we fold it over. And then we have our Christmas card. And I don't even have to sign it.